Welcome back. I would like to uh, start introducing um, our, our speakers one by one. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Paul Batia. Uh, can you tell us a bit more uh, about yourself, Paul? Okay, hello everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, albeit uh, virtually on the screen. So shame that I can't be there with you all today and, and seeing you there. I'm a ambassador for the European Space Agency Business Applications Program. I'm hosted by the University of Nottingham, where I've been working for the last 13 years in satellite applications, mainly in um, satellite navigation and GNSS. I'm one of a team of four people who represent ESA business applications across the UK, and we're here to provide funding to uh, to companies that are developing services that use some sort, of, some sort of space technology. Thank you, Paul. And then we'll move uh, from there to our first, uh, first female speaker uh, and, and the lady on our panel, Annette. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Yes. Hello. My name is Annette Toivonen, and I'm a tourism researcher, so coming from the tourism industry. Um, I'm also an author of a book called Sustainable Space Tourism, an introduction. Um, that is basically followed, I started my PhD, where I investigate how to enhance sustainability in new space industry. I also, two years ago, uh, started um, and established a university course uh, called Responsible Space Tourism, that I have now been teaching for two years in Haga Helia. University of Applied Sciences in Finland. Thank you. And then from there, we've got Sapar Sater, uh, who is Commercial Director at HET. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sapar Sataev. Uh, I'm from Kazakhstan, and I have uh, more than 10 years uh, experience in uh, Kazakh space industry. And uh, from 2020, I joined HET Technology France. It's a company based in Paris. Uh, it's a portfolio company of Chinese head aerospace group uh, company, which is based in Beijing. So uh, we are uh, actually service provider. We are uh, providing uh, Earth observation satellite data in global market from Chinese satellites. Uh, this is our one business domain. And the second business domain is uh, we are uh, developing and uh, operating our low Earth orbit uh, satellite communication system, so Skywalker IoT, to provide services in satellite IoT domain. So we are a fully private company. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, we've got Chris Carberry, who is the CEO of Explore Mars. Chris, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and about Explore okay. Mars? Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I wish I could be there. London is one of my favorite cities on Earth. Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm CEO of Explore Mars. We're a nonprofit based in the U.S. We run the Humans to Mars Summit each year. Also run a lot of STEM education and policy work. Um, and we, we're going to be launching a lot of uh, multilingual programming around the world over the next year as well. So we have a lot of programs coming up, including the Mars Innovation Forums, which will be uh, continuing throughout the next couple of years, which are highly relevant to this um, panel. I'm also the author of a book called Alcohol in Space, believe it or not. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Chris. Uh, the topic of, uh, of our discussion will be on, uh, on, on holistic space. And the reason why we've picked that topic is, is very much hindering, hint, hinting on, on the fact that space has become somewhat more visible to the uh, general population, if you wish. As, as some of our panel, panelists and, and presenters indicated earlier, you know, the space industry has always been there. Um, however, we kind of like feel that we hear like m more of it. And as we hear more of it, that presents um, obviously a, an enlarged interest um, from more actors, uh, more actors that are not just purely passionate about space but they're now passionate about the business opportunity that the space sector uh, presents. And as we've seen, where most of the excitement comes from is very much from the fact that we can now actually go to space um, as normal members of our society, whereas you know, 10 years ago, perhaps that wasn't, uh, that wasn't possible unless, uh, unless you're, you're actually within those organizations going to space. So 
inevitably we will be talking a lot about space tourism in this panel and, and of course what uh, that brings in terms of business opportunities to the wider business uh, sector of space. So starting from there, um, I would like to address the first question which is can space tourism drive the excitement for space exploration beyond the ones passionate about the sector? And uh, I'll address that qu question to Paul first. Paul, can you tell us what you feel the right answer? Okay, so, so thanks, Timo. Um, yeah, I mean, what you said, space is, is getting more visible for everyone. Of course, space is visible to everybody here on Earth, especially in the night. We can see all the stars lighting up the sky. And I guess for, for everybody um, in the room, hopefully, and, and certainly for people of, of my generation, you know, we've grown up with science fiction and we've seen science fiction become science reality in terms of what's happening with, with space travel. In terms of um, the question, I think it, it can be a little bit divisive. There are two, two aspects to looking at this in one that uh, space tourism is obviously, is there a little bit of an echo there? Um, we so can hear you loud and clear, Paul. Uh, Okay, fine. Okay. So, so in terms of that, it can be a little bit divisive in terms of the fact that people may be saying, one faction of society may be saying, well, we need to be focusing more on the problems that we have um, here on Earth and sorting out um, issues here, um, rather than pushing people to, to go out into space. But, but I think that space tourism is, in the whole, making space more... Um, visible and desirable to the general public, the fact that ordinary people can go into space. And right now we have um, three companies that are, that are visibly uh, creating the opportunity for people to go out into space, obviously Virgin Galactic, um, SpaceX and Blue Origin. And these are big name companies, but you know, the fact that we have these three companies who are kind of led by CEOs who are really uh, pushing forward uh, services here on earth um, to push uh, space tourism will mean that it will become more accessible and the technology will become more available and accessible to the general public. So, yeah, I can see on the whole that it is it is making um, space more accessible and interesting to, to the general public. Thank you, Paul. Annette, um, from your perspective, what are some of the peripheral technologies that will emerge now mm. uh, as part of that uh, uh, opportunity for, for more, more humans being taken? Uh, out, out in space? What are some of the technologies that will, will lead that change beyond, obviously, the A to B taking, taking point into space? Yes. Now we have to remember, tourism industry in general is one of the largest industries of the planet. Now this large industry is to join space environment for the first time. So that's something that as a tourism researcher I really would like to point out at this stage that you have to really follow now what are the mega trends in tourism, what have the tourists done before, what are the principles, regulations they are actually accustomed to follow. We are talking about that this is a era of uh, climate uh, change what we are living at the moment. A lot of sustainability issues. We all know when we travel, there was aviation emissions, all these like flight shaming kind of uh, before corona, for example. They have not disappeared. We don't really want to start a space industry that is not sustainable in a long term in a way that, um, that uh, people are kind of felt that they are space shamed if they take part of the flight. That's not a sustainable uh, development. So this really needs to be uh, understood at this point. It can be a really fascinating new adventure tourism sector where people really, you know, uh, you know, go there, experience this kind of cultural awareness of um, of space tourism, kind of seeing as these um, Bezos and Branson and uh, Captain Kirk just said that it's a fantastic feeling just to witness and be part of the universe, really seeing how fragile the earth is and getting the kind of protective feeling. And that's part of the sustainability kind of long-term path. But if basically nobody wants to go, if it really suddenly, like Prince William was mentioning all this, like, uh, that's kind of how the public really sees it at the moment, because they don't really know that much. They just know that they can't go there themselves for a long time. It will take some... This is like early aviation stage. 
when the kind of aviation industry started. First, it was like an elite activity, started in the small scale, but then it that developed, uh, you know, during uh, many decades. It took 50 years to, to start doing mass tourism in that. So these are like long times now for Generation Z that is customed when they are seeing something, they want to do it next week. And at the same time, there is this kind of calculations that it, it's only eight years away until the world uh, climate, um, the warm, global warming will reach that uh, 1.5 and over. So these needs to really be understood at this point. And, uh, but if these are kind of considered, they are taken seriously, they are responded by these space tourism companies. And really, you know, there are some kind of sustainable planning, compensation schemes, all kinds of different uh, ways of actions. That's what actually what I have been writing in my book. <laughs> a lot of uh, information there already. So, um, but the public kind of wants to, to hear how to, you know, be part, of, how to become a space tourist in a way that you can be actually, um, you know, admired for your bravery in stuff that you are space shamed uh, by doing a touristic activity. Surely, an increased demand for um, space space flights will, will then lead to an increased requirement for those space flights to be um, more sustainable, mm -hmm. um, which will inevitably lead to more innovation being targeted at yeah. sustainability the within the sector. Reuse. And uh, you, you know, while, while we appreciate that you know, there are opinions out there um, which uh, essentially indicate that perhaps we should be focusing on more earthly uh, issues, let's not forget that it was because of the space sector that we've realized that we've got a global warming uh, issue. Um, if it wasn't for space, you know, perhaps uh, we would have, uh, would have experienced a far, far worse uh, uh, issue uh, much later uh, in day. But going back to the sustainability questions as we were talking about uh, holistic space, can you, can you perhaps, you, Sapar, tell us um, what, what is your take and what is Head's take in terms of the importance of sustainability within the space sector? Yeah, it's a very uh, important, uh, let's say, topic. Uh, in general, the space industry is always has been as a locomotive uh, and uh, boosting the development of other uh, industries. And uh, if we uh, talk about uh, space industry in uh, Western countries where the different uh, political economical system where space in the private hands uh, you see uh, there is a competition and uh, there is a development of technology and uh, it's good when there is a competition because uh, these three companies if we take SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin and uh, Virgin Galactic they're improving their technology how to uh, bring people in a safe way to space. Actually, uh, if we remember, the first tourist was launched from Kazakhstan in 2001. It was done by the Roscosmos, uh, maybe you know, is uh, American millionaire, Denis Tito, but it was an uh, expensive flight for him. But if we compare when the uh, state uh, plays role in space, in commercial space, and when we uh, compare the private companies place in space tourism, so there is big difference. Now, uh, after the launch of these three, uh, uh, let's say, uh, spaceships, uh, awareness is increased and the people is willing to fly to space, and maybe it's, at the, as Annette said, it's maybe a bit luxury for this moment, but in future, uh, it will be uh, access acceptable for all uh, people. And in terms of sustainability, Yes, it's very important that space industry and, uh, should be uh, resilient and uh, it shouldn't damage uh, the environment. I'm not sure how much damage it can bring to uh, the environment, for example, the flight of these uh, uh, spaceships, but uh, we have to, it's a trade-off, we have to find always balance. So, uh, yeah, uh, we leave humanity, uh, live with inspiration, and with vision to explore space, uh, we have to keep on doing that. But at the same time, yes, we have to develop the certain technology not to damage uh, the environment. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, a question uh, to you, Chris. I, I, uh, 
I feel that we've, we've, we've left you a bit uh, uh, out of the discussion, so I'll, I'll bring you straight back in. Um, can you tell us um, whether becoming more familiarized with the space industry as a society uh, makes space uh, more accessible to SMEs and smaller organizations and not just the big players uh, out there? Oh, absolutely. We're really in an extraordinary time right now. Because, you know, as you mentioned, alluded to, you know, just a few decades ago, space was the exclusive domain of superpowers, large company, countries. Right now, everybody can have a space program. As you've seen, large, middle, and small countries have space programs, but even schools. We see high schools and middle schools around the world setting up CubeSats. And so I think the whole space sector is becoming democratized, and it's really opening up the door. And I think part of the thing we need to do a better job in the space community is explain to the broader um, uh, world, broader society, how they can participate and why this is relevant to them. This isn't just about a few small, you know, large rocket companies. We talk a lot about SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin, as well as a lot of the other big aerospace industries companies. But there are a lot of other people, a lot of other companies pursuing space technology, pursuing sustainability in space, looking at how their products can be advanced through, um, you know, microgravity experiments or potentially future experiments on the moon or Mars. And I think, I think as we look at the problem, we look at all the issues that are coming up. I think Prince, Prince William got mentioned, you know, mentioning why are we investing in this. I think we need to do a better job at showing people why this is important. While it might look a little bit frivolous at times to some people when billionaires are launching themselves into space, this is really important. And this will have, this will probably be one of the look back in time, you know, in 100 years from now is one of the most important periods in human history as we finally are beginning to um, create sustainability, be able to reach beyond without having necessarily to rely entirely on government funding. So I think it's very exciting and I think it will certainly empower a lot of industries that have never, you know, never really been associated with space exploration in the past. So uh, do you feel that um focusing more on, on the question why beyond the, the, obvious, uh, the obvious statement, which is it's cool. Um, it's, it's actually gonna, gonna bring us a better uh, acceptance from, from, from society. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think particularly, once again, we have to show people why this will benefit them. Space exploration has benefited humanity in ways we can't even articulate. It has completely transformed the world since the Apollo program. And I don't think people still understand how much it has impacted us and benefited life here on Earth. Yeah, I think we've alluded to how it's benefited the whole understanding of climate change and things like that. But every day, including right now, we're using space technologies. And I think as more smaller companies are able to invest, it's not, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be a billionaire anymore. You don't have to be a hundred yeah, millionaire. P small companies, individuals can in, uh, invest in things that'll have direct impact here on earth. Looking at problems, for instance, to the Mars lens. How can you, how can you manufacture, how can you grow food or manufacture food on Mars? You know, looking through the Mars lens and how can that be translated back here on Earth? Extracting water from arid areas and, uh, you know, recycling water, you know, uh, remote medicine. We've all learned about the benefits of remote medicine throughout the past year and a half with the pandemic. So there are so many different things that we can learn by looking at them through the space lens that will directly benefit Earth, but also will directly benefit our worldwide economy as well. That's one of the things that excites me the most about space exploration in this age we're living in. The, the extraordinary benefits that will come to you know, the people of Earth, as well as the economy. I don't think that's articulated as well as it should be to the broader public. I, I, I think that probably we should uh, do a better job articulating the benefits of that, perhaps also articulating the benefits of royalties as well, as, you know, <laughs> they also cost a fair amount uh, of, of investment. Uh, moving on from there and uh, touching on 
whether cost is being reduced by those increased activities. Maybe a question to you, Paul. Um, is this kind of open space uh, market currently, like a more accessible space sector, uh, driving costs down uh, overall? Yeah, I think so, for definite. And I, I just come back to this point we've been talking about Prince William and William Shatner, obviously Captain Kirk, 90 years old, going into space. And his response to, to Prince William, who made a very valid point about us focusing on sustainability here on Earth, he actually said, well, you know, this is the trial, the test. Actually, what we want to do is to take those technologies, those industries that are polluting the Earth and causing climate change out into space. So I think that's... That's, um, that's very relevant. And one of the things that the UK government, for example, in its UK space strategy, which is recently launched, is concentrating on is power generation in space. So putting huge arrays of solar panels in space and then beaming that energy down to Earth. And to answer your question, all of these activities are leading to cost reduction. As Chris mentioned, you know, right now, CubeSat technology is accessible to universities. Almost any university you look at is launching a CubeSat mission or a NanoSat mission, and it's, it's brought the cost of access to space right down. And for example, the, the work in the UK to build at least three space ports uh, and the horizontal launch capability in Newquay, in Cornwall, allowing fast and easy access to low Earth orbits, which means that all sorts of companies can now start to develop technologies to actually deliver services and deliver data from space. And access space. And the scheme that I promote, that I'm here as an ambassador before, ESA Business Applications is all about that. And we're here particularly to help SMEs to access data from space and to use that data space, data from space, to build their businesses. So definitely, there are lots of incentives. And for example, another example, Seraphim Space in the UK, a VC, which has recently um, been floated on the stock exchange, and is investing in so many startup companies and the investment community starting to look at space services, the space industry, and obviously the space industry feeding the downstream space service industry. So it's only going to become more and more accessible with so many incentives there to help companies get on board and help them to build sustainable business cases and business plans that also lead to sustainability here on Earth. So it's definitely having a big effect and the costs are coming down. Um, I'm going to address the next question to all of you, and um, I, I, would, I would like to ask each and one of you to name one earthly sector that uh, is led or benefits from, from space exploration. Maybe we start with you, Annette. I think I must just comment on what Chris and Paul said about the kind of the education really is the key here, to really get everybody unitedly to join this kind of new space um, era, because otherwise we are in big trouble if most people don't want to join it and the others try to say that, yes, we are going to have these um, fantastic solutions, but maybe in 10 years' time. And as I did mention, this time scale really, we are continuously, at least in the Nordic countries where I come from, there's a climate change in every single thing, like my students are getting really uh, you know, stressed about this. So that needs to be, now remember, there needs to be concretical things, maybe some virtual reality uh, space, uh, you know, in the meanwhile, before they can actually, rest of us can go, to kind of be part of that in, in some, like, avatar form. So there are a lot of, like, I think the technology could be, uh, we weren't, uh, there were a lot of, like, uh, startup companies mentioned, but some of those could be kind of concentrating on terrestrial space tourism, which is uh, space that you do for, uh, earthbound. It's already existing. We have northern lights in, in Finland, in Lapland. That could be, you could be tied up with some kind of virtual gadgets whilst you are watching the, you know, these kind of solutions. I haven't really seen any, any uh, of such yet. Just to kind of keep everybody in the same boat, that we don't lose the, the half. So that's the, maybe that didn't answer your question, actually, that's my comment. Could you actually repeat? I, I, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask each and one of you to name one earthly sector that is very much benefiting from space exploration in the space sector. That perhaps it's not as obvious to, yeah. to most people out there that they're not uh, very much embedded in, in the space industry. But I think now when we had a corona, for example, we all went uh, to work remotely 
we use Zoom, like they are here now, provided by this like a satellite link and such. So that's one of the definite good parts of uh, space that we had a really a global pandemic, uh, but that we, we, our societies didn't collapse. We were able to function just because there were satellites to provide this link. So this really needs to be, uh, these kind of things need to be uh, highlighted in the public that they don't forget this. But this kind of rhetoric, it's kind of missing, I think, in my opinion. And these things really need to be highlighted. So connectivity? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, so uh, as we uh, segment space market into different like uh, upstream, midstream, downstream, uh, in upstream and the midstream, you know, the state playing a great role, they're creating infrastructure and they're opening all the data to public and the, the startup companies uh, in downstream, they're creating value-added products to the end users. And uh, yeah, uh, there is uh, definitely, for example, if we take the Earth observation industry, uh, you know that uh, in Europe there is a big um, program, Copernicus, uh, which uh, processes data and uh, delivers to the different uh, economic sector the value-added products to the agriculture and the uh, environment, uh, like monitoring and uh, everything. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the second uh, domain, as Annette mentioned, it's a connectivity that we are using now. Uh, there are uh, d several big uh, companies like OneWeb and uh, Starlink, who is planning to deliver j just global internet connectivity. And uh, yeah, it's uh, everything. I think this, all these technologies uh, will benefit uh, for, for the different sector of economy that we are living. Thank you. Yeah. Paul? Okay, so I would cheat here and say every sector, and I would uh, I would justify that by saying, well, the, the scheme that I represent as well, ESA Business Application, supports any sector that can bring satellite data into its um, into its business and a service that delivers that. If you ask me to talk about one specific sector, I will say I will say transport. I mean, transport is being transformed uh, by the use of uh, space data and satellite data. And I'm going to get back to my previous answer, which is everything as well now. So I said I'm a, I've, I've got a background in, in satellite navigation. And we've been reliant on satellite navigation delivered by satellites for, uh, for many decades now. A technology that, that came out of the military domain, a satellite system owned and operated by the US Air Force that has delivered so much benefit that we take for granted nowadays. You know, a lot of you would have just relied on Google Maps to get to the venue today uh, where you were going. Our aircraft rely on satellite navigation systems. And as we move into the domain of connected and autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles, we rely on satellites that are 20,000 kilometers away to provide us positions of less than a meter accuracy. And in fact, a study that was done by the UK a few years ago um, came to the conclusion that if the satellite navigation si systems were shut off, GPS was shut off, that it would cost the UK economy five billion euros, a, a five billion pounds, a billion pounds a day until they could mitigate for that loss. So if you ask me a specific sector, I'll say transport, but I would say every sector. Space is just so, and satellite data is just so ingrained into everything that we take for granted um, nowadays. Chris? I think one which is related to some of the other what other folks have said advanced computing artificial intelligence it's you know it's extremely critical to a lot of the space exploration activities going on right now but as we go further and further into space it'll become even more so you know for instance when we go off hopefully within the next 10 to 15 years go off to Mars um, yeah think how relevant this technology will be when we do not have direct access to Earth. Right now, even when we're in orbit, we have pretty, we have quick communication. We can come back to Earth pretty quickly. Advanced tech, advanced computing is extremely important to that. But, you know, we go to Mars, where we do not have instantaneous communication. We cannot send people back to Earth, you know, in an emergency. Being able to rely on these uh, 
you know, adv advanced intelligent systems for your, for your overall systems, but also for medical help as well, for all elements of trying to maintain human life on another planet or anywhere else in space is vital. And so I think this is gonna be a really huge error. It already is, but I think over the upcoming years it's gonna grow and grow as we rely more and more on these, these uh, artificial intelligent systems. Thank you, Chris. So uh, the short uh, answer to, to people uh, asking as to whether we should not be focusing on the problems here on, on Earth instead is that we already are focusing on, on those problems uh, very much. Um, moving on from there, that will lead me to, uh, to my last question before we, we open for questions from, from the audience here, which is uh, how can we make space even more accessible for people wishing to become entrepreneurs uh, in, in the sector? Uh, I think that it's quite appropriate for me to address that question to you, Paul. Okay, so I think, I think events like this are, are great and more kind of exposure into mainstream media as well. I mean, we are seeing more and more on mainstream media in the newspapers, on the television as well, talk about how important space data is and satellites and things like that. So I think just more and more information dissemination. I think one of the issues that we face, again, I know I keep talking about uh, um, European Space Agency business applications, but one of the things that we really want to connect to is the companies that are non-space, because really, you know, so many um, services and businesses just depend on um, on space data. And one of the things that we see is that, that space is generally regarded as the um, the domain of rocket scientists and boffins. You need to be really, really high intelligent in order to be able to understand the space industry or it's all science fiction well I think you know that's that's not the case it's um, we've seen you know would, would we expect that the three multi-billionaires that we mentioned today would be people who would be leading the new commercial space race in terms of businesses that are moving forward so I think these kind of uh, this kind of exposure is really really um, important and we just need to to continue that, so more events, more engagement, and and putting things for things forward in in a in a language, I guess, that is easier for people to digest and understand, rather than be uh, be overcomplicated. I hope that answers the question. To Thank extent. you, Paul. Annette, from an academic perspective, and someone that's working with a lot of uh, young individuals passionate about the sector. Yes, I do agree with what Paul said very much. I mean, really, the language you talk needs to be so simple that there are no kind of questions of misunderstanding. And this is what the Musk and Bezos and Branson have been really excellent uh, for really making it as like almost like a fun... I mean, they have making documentaries uh, and uh, these kind of live launches. Even my son was watching it. And, he did mention, like, will it explode, these kind of comments, but it's kind of like you're sharing the moment with, with the family. So they are really important, even for, I know that uh, normally if you are coming from the space industry, you, you have maybe quite a technical approach and such, but my, t my style for people is maybe a good one to have as well because of the easier maybe approach and kind of other angle and kind of, you know, we are all part of this now, so it really needs to be the young generation now who are being educated, they are actually the ones who are going to be the space tourists for real. They are the ones who are going to live in the colony in Moon and Mars. So what's the best, I mean, this is an excellent opportunity to really educate them now in the sense of like when you are there, you at least have a knowledge how to um, proceed in the sustainable way because that's the kind of make up we all have to follow in everything we do in life from now on. So I think this is a really, you know, fantastic opportunity in many ways. Uh, but just really to highlight these points, I think is crucial for this industry to, to really succeed because it can, if made sensibly. Saparin, so from your standpoint as a, uh, as, as a representative of a very successful private company within the space sector, what is your advice to young entrepreneurs? Yeah, uh, just there is a saying that in order to be a space millionaire, one should be a billionaire. Uh, it's a joke, uh, but uh, really now space is uh, 
becoming more accessible if we take uh, our company, our company is a purely private company, uh, established one uh, person from China, so he was uh, very eager to work in space and he invested his own money and uh, we are now developing the so-called uh, satellite IoT business and uh, we are launching our own satellites and yeah, uh, there is no any, uh, let's say, uh, fantastic rocket, uh, uh, rocket science, but uh, now uh, it's accessible and uh, one of the, I think, uh, vehicle to develop to boost this uh, accessibility is, as we know that uh, space industry is a science-based and R&D-based uh, industry, so the uh, key uh, source of, uh, let's say, generating en entrepreneurs is uh, universities uh, to developing kind of incubations, accelerator. Uh, there is a, a very good example in UK, uh, Catapult, maybe you know that uh, they are boosting this uh, industry and uh, the same is being done in Europe and in other uh, areas. So yes, uh, and uh, also uh, I, I see the increase of interest from like uh, venture capital industry, from angel clubs, uh, they are now investing in this industry, I just observed uh, a long time ago uh, one report from Tauri Group and they was uh, saying that uh, from 2000 up to 2015 uh, the VC investment in startups, I'm not talking about like big merger and acquisition, it was increased about 10 times from around 1 billion to 13 billion and uh, uh, the important thing is uh, the equity investing is uh, a major part of this uh, investing about 8 billion so the private people the investors are getting interested in so and on the other hand uh, in the uh, downstream uh, now uh, all the satellite images and uh, maybe other data navigation is available and uh, just young people can use it and uh, code it uh, develop applications different for end users so Thank you. Yeah. And last but not least, Chris. Thank you. And as Paul had mentioned earlier, I think one of the key things here is really showing this isn't just about a small group of rocket companies. They are obviously very important. We're not going to go into space without them. But as we were talking about earlier, sustainability is really critical. We're not going to have any long-term presence in space without sustainability. So we have to show all these different sectors that they can play a role in this. I mean, if you're going to create society in space, you need players from all parts of society, as I mentioned earlier, whether it's food production. An example of that is one of my favorites is, you know, uh, you know, related to the book I wrote a, few, a couple of years ago, you know, for instance, the beer manufacturer Budweiser sent barley experiments into space. I believe they sent four of them up. And yeah, they were doing it, you know, partially to promote their brand, you know, show if they could make beer or hopefully whiskey in space one day. But that goes well beyond that, because what they were doing is investing in space agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so it's a direct investment in something that's required for sustainability in space. And there's so many of these different elements that are required that do not require huge companies, as I was mentioning earlier, whether it be food production, whether it be, um, you know, trying to access water from in arid areas, whether it be any, any other, we need, to, we need to breathe, we need to eat, we need to communicate. And so, so many sectors of society, the, the um, logistics, you know, the logistics sector, people working construction. You know, I know Caterpillar has gotten very interested in space exploration. There are so many different areas that can participate, but we also have to let them know that they can play a role in this. This isn't just about, you know, a small group of rocket companies, and it will take everybody to create the sustainability. And I think in the, in the end, it'll end up benefiting them as well. Thank you. Well. That leads us to the end of our session, but before we finish, I would like to uh, see whether there are any questions uh, from uh, the audience here. Uh, if someone is having their head up, I can't really see, because I've got a projector <laughs> straight into my eyes. We have two questions. Uh, 
two virtual questions. Sure. Uh, so we have a question from Mark. He says, how can we promote that space data is good for sustainable development goals at the next annual UN climate change conference? And could space tourism be better than cruises? Would like to take that one. I think that I, I have an idea um, for the uh, UN one. We can get uh, Greta Thunberg to be in the ambassador of the <laughs> of that initiative. But uh, jokes aside, uh, how about can space be better than cruises? They both have the same problem as was mentioned before, the lack of le legislation. So that's something now that needs to be um, regulated in order to kind of convince the public uh, opinion that at least some things are being done. That's a very simple first action to take, at least to show that, you know, okay, this new era um, of uh, space tourism is starting, so we'll at least put some regulations there. Um, cruise industry, obviously, it's, it could be almost considered as like a colony as such, when you think of the, it has like a small society under one, one dark, uh, complex. So, um, they are very, <laughs> Maybe that's something that could be kind of these kind of you know parallels could be used when 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 you know talking trying to convince the public how is it what is the relation because cruise industry obviously it has elderly people there it, it's good in a way that it provides um, an activity for people who may not be able to for example travel otherwise space tourism is something that at the moment. Uh, it could be kind of considered as an actual style of a sport. However, we just saw a William Shatner go, going there as a 90-year-old. So there are kind of you know, similarities when you actually think in these two industries. And they, they could be highlighted. There are a lot of good things, what you think in the cruising, what it represents. But of course, the emissions, all these parts uh, are there. So very, but that's a good question, actually. I need to really start looking into that maybe in my next book. <laughs> Thank you for whoever asked it. I, I feel that we tend to be like slightly ever so more forgiving to things that we've already got wrong uh, here on Earth. You know, we tend to be more forgiving about our carbon footprint when we uh, fly over to the Maldives or uh, over to Spain. Um, and we tend to be uh, more, more forgiving when it comes to our existing mistakes uh, mm -hmm. and seem to be a lot more concerned about uh, what's unknown in, in our future areas. I think that from what we've learned on, from this discussion, our previous discussion, is, is that there are already a lot of efforts being put forward to avoid some of the mistakes, mm -hmm. some of the mistakes of the trial and error approach that we've already been uh, suffering from uh, here, here on Earth. Um, but uh, moving on from there, can we have our uh, next? Sorry, question? can I just add one more thing for, for this, what you just said? Um, about the compensation, that's really important, as mentioned. The tourism industry, you can now compensate, for example, if you have a cruise trip, you can compensate your flight, maybe, and then maybe pay some kind of a green tax on your cruise. So maybe that's something, is, but it's scary now for people, as I did mention, no regulations, really, no such mentionings of these. So this would be a simple thing to do, to convince, you know, that there will be similar things. Then it would be more kind of uh, acceptable. Tax space. <laughs> I, I come from Scandinavia, you know, I know a lot of Americans may think otherwise, but this is kind of like a holistic thing, and this does make sense when you think of it. So the tax space, we've got uh, the, the Chris's example of uh, alcohol in space, so uh, in, you know, it kind of leads to the, the ever-known uh, statement, three things certain in life, debt, tax, and vice, right? Uh, can we have the last question? Uh, we have a question from Alexander. He says, in the EU, if we want to develop the agriculture, should we look for government support or do we do it as a startup? Paul? So I think um, agriculture is a, a massive user of um, space and satellite technology. And uh, there, are, there are lots of schemes that are available. Obviously, there is funding schemes available through, through the Horizon program um, to help in certain areas for agri-tech, for example, um, if not other areas of, um, of agricultural uh, side of things. But also the, the most important thing is if you've got a compelling business plan and you can show that you're, you're 
providing some benefit and making some money, then then why not do it? Why not do it commercially? There's a lot of um, funding out there, a lot of VC, um, and the scheme that that I that I promote as well. I mean, we we give up to 50% of funding for project costs and can be anywhere up to millions of, of euros. And ESA operate the scheme in many countries across Europe. So um, depends. We you know we want to see sustainable services. When we say sustainable services, we mean services that are going to create um, wealth and are going to create some good for for earthly earthly endeavours as well. Well, thank you very much. So that brings us to the actual end of our panel. Round of applause for our panelists, please. Thank you for joining us.